All right, episode 17, we are ready to fire away right now. It's Dan Matthews. I am not the animal. He's the animal. He is Matt Maltepis as we get going here on the Thursday edition of the show. Of course, Dan Matthews, what do we do around here on Thursdays? Well, we get you ready for the weekend that was. Well, what about Tuesdays? We recap the weekend that was. That's how the show goes. So, Matt Maltepis, let's get ready. Let's start firing because we've got a lot of really good action over the weekend. Once we start going through these games, you're going to say, hey, what about Ohio State, Penn State? We're getting to that last, kids. The best is for last in this four-course meal. So let's start with course number one. That is going to be a later game. It is going to be Utah at USC. Both programs kind of scuffling coming into this one, SC especially after the beating they just took in South Bend against the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. But they come back home. The beat-up Utes, Cam Rising beat up. The team beat up coming into this one. The Trojans are a seven-point favorite for this one. And just to show you how much Vegas is trying to tell you, do not take the Utes. The money line is 225 for Utah as we record this one right now. The over-under for this one, 53. How are you seeing this one breaking down out in Los Angeles? So, yeah, despite their quarterback issues this year, the Utah team, I mean, they played tough, and their defense has played pretty mean. Utah is 3-2 against the spread this year, while USC is 2-5 and five against the spread, and they're coming off a big loss against Notre Dame. Talked about last week how USC had not first any good defenses thus far going into their game against Notre Dame and said that that USC offense would – Struggle a bit, and they did. They struggled mightily. They struggled with five turnovers. Now they're going up against Utah defense that's ranked number six in sack percentages, one of the top teams in opponent yards per play and opponent passer rating. Now the question is, is Utah's offense good enough to keep them within seven points on the road, right? That one, the hard part. That's actually why I lean under 56 here. Um, actually, I don't just lean. I actually bet it, but I got to look at the current price. What did you say the current price was, Dan? I saw it at 53. 53, wow, that yeah, so it moved a lot. Uh, I still like it. Utah's offense is one of the worst offenses in yards per play, but all they do is run the ball, and USC doesn't have the best run defense, ranking slightly below average in the nation in yards per carry. Pair that with the fact that Utah's run uh, runs their offense very slow, ranking as one of the slowest teams in the nation. They should be able to burn a lot of clock with the ground game, while the youth's defense should make enough stops against this Caleb Williams-led Trojans team, and this is the worst offense in yards per play that USC will face this season. The best defense next to Notre Dame that the Trojans will face. And at the same time, um, this is by far the slowest team that USC has faced. So, I mean, if USC is ever going to have a game this year where they, you know, the game isn't so much of a shootout, I, I see this one being it. I bet under 56 here. Yeah, I mean, interesting enough. I mean, because, yes, this is a USC defense that especially took it on the chin last week against Notre Dame. Alex Grinch is all but fired at, at the end of the season. I mean, if nothing else, like I said, certain coaches have blind spots. It seems like that side of the ball might be a blind spot for Lincoln Riley. But I've got to believe enough influential people out there in Los Angeles are going to knock on Lincoln's door as they get into the offseason and say, yeah, you're D.C., I thought we made improvements. No, you didn't make enough improvements. He's gone. We want him gone. And Lincoln will probably go out and get whatever hot shot defensive coordinator is out there and hopefully be able to finally say, all right, hey, I've got that side of the ball figured out. Because until that happens, there will be no national championship dreams out in L.A. for USC because that is a major issue for them. And it's frankly kept them from reaching top goals. I mean, when you've got a quarterback like Caleb Williams – you should have a capable defense on the other side. It's kind of like what we talked about with LSU. Although the last couple of weeks, LSU seems like they kind of got it figured out defensively. So I don't know. Who knows? All right, uh, let's go to uh, Tallahassee, uh, Florida State, and Duke for this one. Number 16, Duke is at number four. Florida State, the Knowles, a heavy favorite in this one, 14 and a hook. So they're telling you they got to cover more than two touchdowns in this one. So that means that Florida State would need to win this one almost by three scores in order for you to be able to win this one. Uh, the money line for Duke, I mean, even more inflated than the Utah one, uh, plus uh, 400, and then uh, the over-under for this one is 49. 14 and a half, Riley Leonard on the other sideline. I mean, you know, we've seen this wow. Florida State team put up some serious numbers this year, but, I mean, like I said, Matt, are, are we thinking three scores? So, yeah, I mean, 
you know, it's a lot of points. Both teams coming into this game with a 4-2 and two record against the spread. And they both have similar margin of victories uh, with Florida State being only two points higher. When I looked at the strength of schedule for both squads here. I think uh, pretty even. I mean, both teams versed Clemson. Duke beat them 28-7. to seven. Took Florida State overtime to beat them. And I believe Duke versus Notre Dame, and they give them a good shot, and they played pretty damn good. So put up a good fight. They only lost by one score. I mean, honestly, when I think back to that game, they had a shot to win that game. They didn't miss those two field goals uh, and turn over that ball twice. So meanwhile, I mean, Florida State defense, not the best. They ranked 41st in the nation in opponent yards per play. And to me, they haven't versed any quality teams in the yards per play metric. So the average rank their opponents in the yards per play metric averages out to 74. Not impressive. Now, I don't think the Blue Devils win this game on the road, but getting 14 is a different story. Um, I, I haven't bet this one, and I haven't looked to bet it, but if I was four to, I mean, forced to, you got to lean the dog plus 14, 14 and a half. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I mean, I, I just I feel like that, you know, the way that Florida State has played this season has been awesome. I mean, last week just crushing Syracuse. I took Florida State in that one. I just felt like this was a Q's team that was starting to trend down a little bit after that Clemson game. But, I mean, 14 and a hook. Um, I got I, I to gotta think that probably you would want to skew more Duke's side on that one. But, I mean, again, you know, Mike Norvell's team has uh, shown up when it's mattered most this season. So uh, maybe that will be the case for this one. All right, let's get to the two major ones that we've got this weekend. We have got two, uh, I mean, you know, just outside the top 15. I mean, with uh, Tennessee uh, getting a huge win last week over Texas A&M at home. Now they go on the road against Bama, the vaunted revenge game for Nick Saban and Alabama as uh, the Crimson Tide in this one favored by eight, uh, as well as uh, the, uh, the money line is plus 255 for Tennessee. The over-under, 48 and a hook. Matt, I got to tell you, even before you get going here, a lot of people I'm talking with are really looking at that under. And you look at the way that this game was last year. Of course, you had much different players on the field for that game last year. Jalen Hyatt um, and, and uh, you know, just a lot of, uh, you know, uh, as well as uh, Hendon Hooker. Uh, just a lot of really good offense for Tennessee. Is that one, what was it, 52-49 was the final? If you had told people a year ago, hey, the over-under is going to be 48 and a hook, and people are going to be leaning the under. How are you feeling about this one? I'm actually looking more towards the side. I mean, Alabama comes in this game 4-3 and three record against the spread, 14.1 point margin of victory. Uh, Tennessee comes in this game 4-3 and three against the spread as well with a 16.5 margin of victory. But to me, the big difference here is in the competition both teams have played. I think Alabama's played a much harder and tougher schedule thus far. I mean, they face – Five top 50 teams in the nation with four of those five teams actually ranking top 35 in the nation, in my opinion, uh, my rankings. On the flip side, Tennessee has only versed three of top 50 teams, and two of those three have ranked outside the top 35. So despite a you know, hard road for Alabama, they have won every game except the game against Texas. Both teams rely on the run game heavily, but I think Alabama's defense is more suited to stop the run than Tennessee. I mean, when we look at Tennessee's opponents, none of them rank highly in the yards per play metric, while – Alabama's faced a couple of the best teams in the yards per play metric, such as Texas and Mississippi, and they had both they held both teams an average of 2.4 carry. I mean, I haven't bet this game, but it's currently sitting at you know eight and a half. Last I checked, around the nine area. But if you know it, it's in between the two middle key two key numbers, seven and ten, I want to see if someone comes put some money on Tennessee and pushes this game closer to seven, so I can lead a seven with Alabama at home. I mean, I think Alabama comes with vengeance, and I. I can't see the Tennessee team coming within a touchdown in Tuscaloosa. Yeah, I mean, uh, that is uh, going to be a game, too. I mean, you got to think about it as well. Both teams still fighting for their SEC championship dream lives. Uh, Bama right now is in control of the SEC West. If Tennessee wins this one and we're able to knock off a Brock Bowers-less Georgia when they come to Knoxville here in a few weeks, then all of a sudden Tennessee would be in the driver's seat in the East. But that's still a long way off, and the Vols still have a lot to play for here, even with that loss to Florida. Uh, so uh, we'll see how it all shakes out. All right, 
The game of the week, the one we are all looking forward to. It's going to be the Fox uh, noon kickoff game there on the major network. That means Gus Johnson. That means Joel Klatt there in the Horseshoe. Had a chance to go to the Horseshoe last year. It is an awesome place. If you ever have a chance to go up there and catch a game, I seriously recommend it. But it is going to be number seven Penn State on the road taking on number three Ohio State. Uh, this is the first of three major games for the conference this year because Penn State will soon host Michigan. And then, of course, at the end of the season, it's going to be the Wolverines hosting Ohio State for whoever comes out of that side of the Big Ten. Uh, but uh, Ohio State for this one, at least as I see it right now, is a five-point favorite for this one. Money line Penn State is plus 170 if you want to go that value route. And then the over-under, 45 and a hook. Uh, you, you gave a little bit of a lean of how you were thinking about this game in Tuesday's episode. How are you feeling about it a couple of days later? So, yeah, both of these games, uh, teams coming into this game undefeated. Penn State 6-0 against the spread, the highest margin of victory in the nation, has looked amazing. Uh, meanwhile, Ohio State's looked pretty good, but they're 3-2-1 against the spread with the fifth highest margin of victory. Big difference again, level of competition, each team's reverse. So Ohio State's had a tougher schedule thus far. And is undefeated nonetheless. I mean, they have quality wins over Notre Dame and Maryland. Meanwhile, Penn State's best two wins come against West Virginia and Iowa. As I look at my rankings, Notre Dame is ranked way higher than any of these teams. Uh, Penn State is yet to verse a team with any resemblance, of my, in my opinion, of a good offense. Now, they'll be versing a top 20 team in yards per play. Penn State is yet to verse a team that is as good as, as Ohio State at stopping the run. I mean, Ohio State, again, is a top 20 team against the run. Penn State's been amazing, but I'm – I don't think taking the dog here is to move. The line seem, seemed early to be moving towards three. I saw some three and a halfs out there. Now we're starting to see some four and a halfs, five. Uh, I was hoping I could take three in Ohio State, you know, but it looks like that line's at four and a half, five. I haven't touched it, but I really can't see Penn State, you know, winning this game. And I, I don't think they cover the spread. I like Ohio State minus the four if I can catch four. Uh, but I was really looking for the three. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's still a lot of time left to go. I, I think that probably the thing that's the sticking point for a lot of people out there is uh, shout out Josh Pate, late kick Josh, um, you know, pointing this stat out. Uh, Penn State and passing offense, 80th in the country. Ohio State seems like they've kind of found their passing offense a little bit. Sounds like Kyle McCord, a guy that's from your area up there in the Philadelphia area. Uh, he uh, is uh, really starting to find his legs underneath them. I mean, I know they didn't have a Mecca Egbuka last week at Purdue. Um, I don't know what his status is going to be for this one, but of course you still have Marvin Harrison the second and a lot of other really talented players on that side of the ball for Ohio State. All of that, plus they're at home. I'm with yeah. you, man. I, I, I lean Ohio State in this one. And, and look, this is the thing, and I talked about this in an earlier episode uh, earlier on in the season is that we could be looking at a scenario here where all three cannibalize each other, where Ohio State wins this one, but then Penn State is able to bounce back, rebound, and beat Michigan at home in a couple of weeks. And then, of course, at the end of the season, Thanksgiving weekend, when it's at the big house that Michigan is able to beat Ohio State, and then it's at the end of the season, everybody looking around for tiebreaker scenarios and saying, wait a minute. Who then from these three goes to Indianapolis for the Big Ten championship game? I guess yeah. uh, time will tell. There's still a lot of football left to be played in between now and then. Matt Maltepis, any final words, sir? Uh, just other than keep firing and keep winning, not much. Uh, you know what? Actually, subscribe, like if you like the content. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube. Comment what you guys like from these games in the comments below. And keep firing. There you go. Write them down. Write them down. Right there. Right there. Throw them down there. That's what we need from you. All right. That's episode 17 of Dan Matthews and the Animals. I'm Dan Matthews. He is the animal. As uh, There we go. As a matter of fact, I pointed the wrong way again. Jeez. You know what? I just need to get out of here. That's 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 what I need to do, Wrap and I need up. to let you. Uh, yep, yep. There we go. I got the music. The Academy Band is playing. All right. That's going to be it. episode 17. Everybody have a good weekend. Good luck this weekend. And, of course, we will talk to you all on Tuesday.